Hey guys, Greg Knuckles here, and today we're talking about steroids. Uh, it's something I get asked about all the time, so I figured it was worth a video response. Uh, m most specifically, I get asked, how can you know if someone is using steroids? Um, and so my short answer is, if you have to ask the question, you probably can't know. Uh, so I honestly think you're wasting your time even asking. Um, and so this video will be elaborating on that. But basically what I mean is that, uh, you know, you can look at guys like, say, on the Mr. Olympia stage, and you really shouldn't have to ask if they're using steroids or not. Um, but, for example, take someone like a professional athlete or a top-level powerlifter, weightlifter, crossfitter. Um, are they on drugs? You know, kind of some gray area there. It's not, it's not as self-evident. Uh, and so what I want to do in this video is talk about... Uh, you know, objections people raise, uh, perceived red flags that get thrown up, uh, and talk about how um, they're really not that good of indicators. Uh, so first things first, um, people will talk about how strong someone is. They'll say, oh, that person can lift so much weight, uh, drugs help you get strong, therefore that person's probably on steroids. Uh, I really don't think that's a good argument at all, uh, simply because you can look back to a time before steroids and there were still plenty of strong people doing plenty of awesome things. Uh, just some of my favorites. Uh, Arthur Saxon bent pressed over 400 pounds. Uh, and if you don't know what a bent press is, it's, uh, it's like a one-arm barbell shoulder press with over 400 pounds. Uh, you know, most people are happy to bench press that, and this dude's just tossing it over his head one-handed, which is absurd. Um, Ermon Garner. Uh, deadlifted 727 pounds with one hand. Uh, and again, that's not with straps, that's just bending over, hook gripping the bar, and ripping it. Uh, and that hasn't been equal to this day. Um, and then Paul Anderson, um, regardless of what you think about the claim that he squatted over a thousand pounds, he had multiple witnesses on multiple occasions uh, seeing him squat over eight, or seeing him squat 800 pounds for 10 reps raw which, um, you know, there's maybe at most a handful of people today who could do that. Um, Andre Milanichev's the only one coming to mind right off who might be able to. Um, so yeah, I mean, there were exceptional feats of strength that occurred before steroids even existed. Uh, so to assume that someone has to be on steroids to do stuff like that, or even is probably on steroids to do stuff like that, I think is misguided. Um, the next thing that people say uh, is they'll point to how big someone is, uh, how much muscle they're carrying on their frame. And I think, I think that's a, a more reasonable objection, um, but I don't, I don't think that it's foolproof. Uh, like I said, you can look at guys like the people in the Mr. Olympia stage who are, who are just outrageously big, um, and I, th I think you have every right to assume that they're all on uh, you know, everything in the kitchen sink. Uh, you know, but people who you have to ask about, uh, can you really know that? Um, people will point to something like the fat-free mass index. Uh, and what that was is it was a scientific attempt to uh, kind of predict how big people could be without drugs. Uh, and what, uh, what this researcher did is he looked at the best bodybuilders before steroids existed uh, and worked based off of the assumption that... Um, However big they got was was about as big as you could get without drugs. Um, and I don't think that's a good assumption for two reasons. Uh, firstly, um, even based off of those standards, there were people around before drugs who uh, would have been flagged as steroid users by the fat-free mass index. Uh, so you can look at someone like Eugene Sandow, um, who he was he was one of the mass monsters of his day. And by the fat-free mass index, um, one would assume that he was on steroids, which obviously he wasn't, because steroids didn't exist. Um, so, so that's a problem in and of itself, because it doesn't take into account genetic outliers, which, uh, when you're talking about someone at the top of their respective sport, odds are you're talking about a genetic outlier, which I don't think the fat-free mass index uh, deals with that well. Um, and the other thing you have to deal with is uh, training and nutrition. Um, you know, these were the biggest guys in the 1940s and 50s, but I think it's wrongheaded to assume that we haven't made 
uh, at least some sort of advancement in regards to training and nutrition uh, since the 40s and 50s. So, um, you know, I, I understand when people uh, point to someone's physical size, and like I said, out, outside of certain limits, I think that uh, I think that that can be a good indicator. But um, in general, if it's someone who uh, who is questionable, um, I don't think that uh, the fat-free mass index really brings much to bear on the situation. Um, so now let's talk about drug testing, because um, you know people people hope that drug testing uh, will you know, help separate the people using drugs from not using drugs. Um, and I think even the best testing can't do that that well. But first of all, you have to deal with not so good testing, which is pretty common. Um, so you have to look at in-contest versus out-of-contest testing. A lot of organizations that say they're drug-free organizations uh, can really at most say they're drug-tested organizations because uh, they're only testing in-contest. Um, and what that means is if I only compete once a year, I can use everything in the kitchen sink for, you know, 10, 11 months out of the year as long as I cycle off in time for the meat. Um, you know, so, so the only thing you can say is that person peed clean on this one particular day. It, do, it doesn't say anything about what they were doing the rest of the year. Um, so, I mean, obviously that's, that's an absurdly big loophole. Uh, so then you have to ask about... Um, you know, organizations that do have out-of-contest testing. Uh, you know, most, um, well, okay, and uh, organizations that only have in-contest testing, um, as far as I know, CrossFit is still like that. Um, most powerlifting organizations that say they're drug-free are like that. Um, and USA Weightlifting, until you get on um, the USADA watch list, um, I'm pretty sure they're like that as well. Um, so yeah, that's that, you know, and that accounts for the vast majority of people who um, are competing in what they think are drug-free organizations. Uh, and you know, that's not um, that's not bad mouthing those organizations because <laughs> drug testing is really expensive, um, and there's there's really, for the most part, there's not any money in strength sports and. Even then, if there is some, it's for the athletes usually and not the meat promoters. So, so I can understand it on practical grounds. Uh, I'm just saying it's not a very good way to catch people who are using drugs. Um, okay, so now addressing uh, out-of-contest testing. Um, so there you have uh, problems with the limits of drug testing. And, uh, you know, drug testing is always getting better. They're always uh, looking to improve upon their techniques. Uh, to make them more sensitive so they can catch more people. Uh, but as it stands now, uh, it's not that hard to beat a drug test. Um, really all you have to do is uh, take things that have natural metabolites um, and that have short enough half-lives and take them in moderate doses. Uh, so what I mean by that is uh, take something like DECA. Uh, your body doesn't make DECA and DECA has um, you know, very distinctive metabolites. So if someone takes your blood or takes your urine um, and you have DECA or DECA metabolites in it, they know you were on DECA and that you were using drugs. Um, but then take something like testosterone, which, well, if they take your urine and take your blood and you have testosterone in it, then congratulations, you're alive. So what can you really do with that? Uh, so what they do um, to try to catch people who are using is um, for these various hormones, uh, you you either have to fall within a specific range or um, whatever hormone they're looking at has to uh, be within an accepted ratio to other hormones that um, they have pre-established ratios for. Um, but so really all that means, that doesn't mean you can't use. That means that you have to use little enough that or take uh, things with short enough half-lives that when you actually pee in a cup or when they take your blood, that you won't be out of those normal ranges, um, which is a, d a different animal entirely from not being on altogether. Uh, so things things you can take, uh, testosterone um, with a fairly short half-life, um, human growth hormone, IGF-1, um, insulin, uh, and EPO. Uh, you know, and those things 
all have very substantial effects. Um, testosterone increases protein synthesis. Um, human growth hormone has a lot of effects throughout the body. Uh, IGF-1 is uh, the hormone through which growth hormone exerts most of its effects. Um, insulin for glycogen resynthesis. Um, and EPO for increased red blood cell production. You, you can take all of those things and as long as you don't have your dose too high, you'll never test positive. Uh, and case in point for that is Lance Armstrong, uh, most tested athlete in the history of professional sports. Uh, we know he's a drug cheat because he got ratted out, um, not because he ever tested positive, because you know he got tested over 500 times and he never tested positive, uh, which, you know, and, and he was on the whole time. So if there's any indication that even the most sophisticated drug testing procedures right now don't always catch people, uh, like I said, there's your case in point right there. Uh, so now that we're to this point, what do you do with this information? Uh, a lot of people are cynical and say, um, you know, if, if these are the things that, uh, if these are the loopholes that there are, then you can assume that the top people in any sport are probably exploiting those loopholes. Um, and I don't know that you can make that assumption because, like I said, uh, you can take some stuff and you can get some benefit from it, but since you can't take stuff in really high doses um, to get the huge benefits that you see from you know, the guys on the Mr. Olympia stage, um, I still think that uh, purportedly drug-free sports I still think a true drug-free athlete can compete at the top level, um, simply because even though drug testing can't catch everyone who uses, um, it does peop it does keep people from using really high doses. So it does limit the benefits people can get from drugs. Um, so so I'm not a cynic like that. Uh, honestly, what I think you should do with this information is stop worrying about things you can't control. Um, you can't control if someone is using drugs. Uh, you just simply can't. If you show up at a meet and a guy beats you and he was on drugs and he tests clean, you have no control over that. Like you simply, you simply don't. And so, the way I see it, it's not worth worrying about. Um, worry about things you can control. Worry about your training, your diet, uh, how well you're sleeping, recovering. Um, you know, put your mental energy into those things, not worrying about who is using what. Um, you know, just be an adult, accept responsibility for your own actions, and if someone else is doing something that's unethical, um, you know, that's between them and their conscience. Um, so that's really about all I have to say about the subject. Uh, thank you for watching. Uh, if you liked the video, uh, like and subscribe. Uh, check out my blog, um, gregknuckles.com, and my brand new website, uh, pushingitfurther.com. Um, so, hope you enjoyed the video.